We are back with another episode of Meet the Press Reports, where each week we do a deep dive into one subject. This week it's the electorate. We're talking to the voters who will decide this country's balance of power. We did this in 2020 at the county level when we tested black voter enthusiasm in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, where it turns out Biden's victory statewide came down to the extra enthusiasm in that county. How about Maricopa County, Arizona, America's largest suburb, where Biden took the big cities and the suburbs of just Phoenix in a state that once leaned Republican. Then there was Miami-Dade County, Florida, where we were asking this question. Will the charge that Democrats have embraced a new type of socialism led by Bernie Sanders, will that resonate? In the wrong way with the large Cuban and Venezuelan communities? Well, it did. And guess what? Trump's entire, just about his entire margin of victory in the state of Florida came down to the extra votes he won in Miami-Dade from 16 to 20. So this election cycle, NBC News will once again zero in on the key counties that are going to tell the story of this election. One year out from the 2022 midterms, we're going to unveil seven new counties that we're spotlighting in our ongoing county-to-county -county project. Might not always be obvious why we're looking at the county level. These aren't key house districts or giant swing states. But over the last century, we've, had a, we've been in the midst of a dramatic resorting of simply where people live. Democrats and Republicans, they don't live next door to each other as much, if at all. Some don't even live in the same zip code, let alone the same county. So by looking at slices of the electorate down at the county level, we actually get to see the impact of geography, race, and income. How big is that impact? And how much does party ID perhaps trump all of it? So this year... We have seven counties to look at seven slices of the electorate and enthusiasm, large or small in those places, will give us a hint about the turnout in the battleground states themselves, all of which have competitive Senate races. These seven counties also are on the front lines of some of our most intense cultural battles, from the ongoing struggle for the soul of the Republican Party that can be seen uh, among evangelicals in North Georgia or college-educated Republicans in Ohio, to economic downturns that have led to a distrust in the political system from rural minorities in North Carolina, union members in Pennsylvania. The, how about the diversifying suburbs, changing the landscape, places like Reno, Nevada, Madison, Wisconsin, and Jacksonville, Florida. At a time of transition for both parties, it is these voters, their motivations, which will set the long-term trends in our politics going forward. My colleagues Shaquille Brewster, Antonio Hilton, and Dasha Burns are on the ground in some of these counties with a lot more. Norb Dossel's family has been working this Pennsylvania soil for decades. How long have you been in Luzerne County? My entire life. In that time, this blue-collar county has seen a political ground shift. What do you think took this county from being a solidly blue place to now double digits for Trump? They liked what they heard. A lot has changed here since Barack Obama sat on this very stool in 2008. Luzerne County had elected Democrats since 1988, but that all changed in 2016 when Trump won here by double digits, and he did it again in 2020. I don't think the, Demo the, the Democrats value the blue-collar worker anymore. Cameron Cox is a self-described former Blue Dog Democrat, a union man. He didn't vote for Trump, but he did recently re-register as a Republican. What made you look around in the Democratic Party and feel like it doesn't feel like home anymore? Go to work in cowboy boots or, or work boots, fire-resistant clothing, being covered in grease. Go to a Democratic Party event and see, look around the room. See if anyone else looks like you. They don't. The county's GOP chairman credits the party's gains here totally to Trump. But he wonders whether the change will last. In 2022, my biggest concern is, are the voters that voted for Donald Trump going to come out in that election? Unlike Luzerne, affluent Delaware County, Ohio, has been a longtime GOP stronghold. But like Luzerne, its politics are pivoting. This is Melanie Farkas. She's a Democrat running for local office here, but she thinks she has a shot because of some of the changes in this county. Donald Trump won Delaware County by 16 points in 2016, but that margin narrowed to just seven points in 2020. I think the politics of the last four years have, has made a lot of people rethink um, their party. That's what happened to Merv Rowland, a lifelong Republican, now a registered Democrat. It's just turned into reality TV. You know, it wasn't about policy. It wasn't about, you know, ideas. It was just about conflict, about good TV. 
The rapid population growth has also had an impact on the politics. Young families like myself are calling that home now. Lindsay Gard grew up as a Delaware County Republican, but then she moved away, and when she came back, she brought a new political identity with her. I have a son who um, has some unique medical needs. That's one of the issues that I have found myself more progressive than I thought I was. Healthcare reform has become very important to me. Lindsay's dad, Carl Gebhardt, still identifies as a Republican. He voted for Trump in 2016, but later stepped down as the county's GOP chair because he couldn't support him again. When we talk about Trump's margins narrowing mm -hmm. in 2020, you, you were a part of that. I was. I'm hoping that that's being realized, you know, because if not, then there's going to be this group of people that are out there wandering around the political wilderness. But current GOP chair Steve Cutler says people like Carl will come home for the midterms. Folks don't like um, the ineffective withdrawal from Afghanistan. They don't like gas prices. They don't like the milk prices going up. And I think at the end of the day, everybody's going to be coming home and the midterms will be very successful for them. This is Antonia Hilton in Anson County, North Carolina, a quiet rural community with more churches than anything else. It's almost 50 50 black and white and voters here are older and focused on essentials. At a Friday night high school football game, Howard McLean, the Anson County Schools superintendent, greets his students and parents, many of whom are struggling. And if you had to name the top three issues for people who are living here. I would say that small districts need to be heard. So education, jobs, and representation of the small districts. Since 2010, the county has lost 18% of its population. Almost 60% of the district's families live in poverty. And every year, dozens of students experience homelessness. Past history has shown by young people that their voices, it's hard for, for them to be heard in a small district. So that does not um, give them the enthusiasm to go out and vote because they say my voice is not going to be heard anyway. I'm from Anson County. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won the county by 13 points. In 2020, Joe Biden only took it by four. Community leaders say that older black voters have seen so much inequity in recent years that some are losing faith. In Anson, black voters aren't clashing over climate change or abortion. They want economic relief. There are families still without running water or internet. Our inn is, the actual building is 111 years old. Voters like Melanie County, the owner of a bed and breakfast called the Dream Inn, are holding out hope in the face of frustration. You would hear someone from the, on the state level say, we've got money coming, but where is it going? Is it going to where it needs to go? We need broadband, okay? About a thousand miles away in Dane County, Wisconsin, the state capital and home to University of Wisconsin-Madison, the electorate is anchored by young liberals, free to think big about climate change, gun control, and racial justice. Sophomore Chandra Chohan is a norm, not an exception here. With my generation, we have never lived in a peri period in which America has never been in a crisis. She interns for Alex Lazary, one of the Democrats fighting to take a Senate seat from Republican Ron Johnson. Do you think young people are going to show up for these midterms? Historically, they often sit them out. I think 2020 was more substantial for America, was more substantial for the voting population than we realized. And I think 2020 taught people the importance of showing up. 2020 also showed the importance of their state. Joe Biden beat President Trump by less than a percentage point. Democratic organizers like Brianna Korth say too much is at stake. In Wisconsin, we constantly have to be thinking about what is our next step? What is our next move? Um, this election in 2022, especially with the governor, has broader implications for 2024. Thinking about voting rights, but like activism within the office to make sure that people like students have the right to vote in all elections is hugely important. Over the course of the next year, Chandra plans to have peer-to-peer -peer conversations with other young voters on campus to ensure they don't lose sight of their power. I want people to know that their voice does matter, and that starts with the vote. I'm Shaquille Brewster in Duval County, Florida, where things have changed quickly. New homes going in everywhere. I see major changes going on. The sprawling county spanning the Jacksonville area was a longtime Republican stronghold. But President Biden flipped it, earning 51% of the vote and becoming the first Democratic presidential candidate to win here in 44 years. You saw that Joe Biden made great inroads into suburban voters here in Duval County. 
Now it's a priority for both parties. Duval County is purple. It is a battleground, and we are locked in a street fight to carry our ideas to the street, to the people, and reverse the tide of Democrat gains. In order for us to keep that momentum, we have to lay down and continue to do the work. President Biden benefited from some significant shifts here in Duval County. Whites are no longer a racial majority, and there are some suburban voters who were simply turned off by President Trump. The question now, do those shifts continue with the former president no longer on the ballot? It's nice to have a calm presidential person and not a drama queen every day. Connie Duke calls herself a conservative independent who voted for Biden. I would give President Biden a B, and it's not just his doing. It's the lack of cooperation that I'm seeing. Attending a high school homecoming football game, the Nortons say Biden has not been a uniter. How are you viewing the new president? Not so, not, not so favorably. positively. Um, not favorably. To me, a lot of negatives and a lot, to me, a lot more divisiveness than I saw before. But Democrats were also boosted by increased turnout from a larger base here, assisted by Andrew Gillum's 2018 campaign and the social justice movement after George Floyd's murder. If Congress and the president and the and, the, and, and, and leadership is not able uh, to solidify those issues, I, I worry it may have an impact in the midterm election. You're talking about voting rights and police reform? Exactly. Warning recent trends are fragile, if not matched, with significant progress. You voted in 2020. Yes, and I will never vote again. Why not? Because there's no change. I don't feel like I was hurt. Anything that could be done in the next year to change that for you? Change. Not feeling hurt. It's actually a common theme for voters across the spectrum. We saw it from African Americans in rural North Carolina. You just heard it there from a Jacksonville resident. You got Republicans in deep red Georgia. They feel the same way. They may be more open to Trump's election fraud lies, and yet they still feel unheard. So my colleague, NBC News data journalist uh, Dante Chin, he sat down with voters from these counties to hear what motivates them, or frankly, what doesn't. Pastor, we have you on this call in part because one of the reasons we went down to Anson County was this is a county that's about half black, half white, and uh, it the it went Democratic as as we kind of expected it to do in 2020, but but it was much closer than it was in 2016. There's a quiet mobilization of the Republican Party. I'm sure uh, that area is still heavily Republican and. Trump country. Is there, a, is there essentially like a black, white, Republican, Democratic divide in the community? Is it, is it that the, the one half of the community tends to be Democratic and the other half tends to be Republican, or is it more complicated? Than that? No, absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's pretty much split down the middle. And really what will be the indicator of victory is if people will come out and vote and especially black voters. And one of the things that's plagued that area is the apathy in voting. Where are people's heads right now? Well, I'm a college professor, so um, I'm with students every day. My friends are all worried about gas prices, not politics. And my students are all about issues not politicians. Chandra, how about, how, about up in, how about up in Madison? I mean, that's a lot of times younger voters have different kinds of issues on their minds. So what, what, are, you, what are you hearing from, uh, what are you hearing from people? I, I think that big, bigger issues are uh, racial inequality, racial injustice. I think gun control is a big one, especially growing up in a society where we, we in elementary school, middle school, high school have to, had to do active shooter drills, um, you know, growing up. And I think another thing is LGBTQ rights, women's rights, um, climate change. I think, you know, every generation has a big issue that I think dominates, you know, the political climate. And I think going forward, climate change is going to be something that's big that we're going to have to tackle um, as a generation. So I think these are these are a lot of the bigger issues. You know, let's just say gun control, March for Our Lives movement. That's my thing. I'm going to advocate for that the most, and I'm going to go with it. Is, is our mask mandates, vaccines, are these big issues, or, or what are the issues that are motivating people? Well, we don't we don't have any mass mandates in our in our county, and people are pretty open and and don't wear masks that often. So 
uh, you know, we were pretty open from that standpoint. Everybody's still making the vaccine very political thing. Uh, there's a lot of resistance to that uh, that I've seen. Um, surprisingly, I can't imagine at this point, even after people have gotten violently ill, uh, there's still resistance to it, which is amazing. And it's it's all based on political views. It's not based on science, it's not based on fact, it's not based on reality. And Chandra and Mike, I, w- I want to get this question with, with you two too, because you both live in places that, that lean pretty, one lean's pretty far left, one lean's pretty far right. How does how has this affected the conversations where you are? Well, you, you have to be really careful about what you put on Facebook now. I mean, uh, if someone, there's a lot more people in Facebook, your friends in Facebook that don't see things exactly the way you do. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they, they will, I mean, they will jump all over you. But, That's interesting. So, so actually talking amongst people in the county, Politics is a pretty safe topic, but once you get on Facebook and you're dealing with extended networks of people, it gets a little more complicated. I'm going to piggyback off of um, what Mike was talking about in regards to social media, because I think social media is an integral part of, I think, youth activism and I think what, you know, how we communicate in my generation. So I think what I've seen is there is a lot of polarization in terms of social media where I have heard people say oh, someone posted about this political view, I unfollowed them or, you know, I blocked them. Um, So I think you're seeing this, you know, hard line divide between people that, you know, might not be explicitly seen in person. We're starting to see some of the the partisan politics showing up more at the local level in nonpartisan races. Um, I had a person today tell me, you know, a school board uh, candidate came to their door and said, I'm the conservative one. And, you know, they're really pushing the, the uh, party uh, mantra, if you will, at the local level for school board, as opposed to, you know, here's what I think about the curriculum in our school. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, a Senate race coming up and uh, midterm, and, and people are paying attention to that. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of controversy, as you well know, about the elections in Georgia. And uh, that's still uh, a big issue with people. There's a lot of concerns, uh, a lot of people falling out on both sides of that as to uh, did we have election fraud or did we not, to what level was it at, and all that. So uh, that, that's a big thing. And, and Carl, let me ask you, you're, you're in one of those suburban environments that's changed a bit too. Uh, do, do things feel like they're reverting back to the way they were a little bit, like temperatures come down or... You know, Ohio, uh, we have a great Secretary of State. Um, we have a great uh, Board of Elections here in the county. And, you know, the uh, when people talk about the stealing of the election or voter fraud, it's not in Ohio and it's not in, in Delaware County. It's, it's somewhere else, but it's not here. We do it right. And, you know, that's the way they, they want to think about it. But uh, it's in those other states, such as Georgia or Arizona or you know Michigan, places like uh, Pennsylvania, that had the controversy that they're concerned about. Paul, can I ask you? It's you, you're in a you're in a place that's swung a lot in, uh, th- throughout the Trump throughout the Trump presidency. Does it do, do things feel like they're reverting more to the way they were? Or do, do things still yeah, feel like very, yeah. you know long supporters of the Republican Party have taken a step back because it's it turned in a way that's not particularly healthy, really. Um, you know, I, I don't say I'm ashamed to be a Republican, because I'm not, but I'm, I'm concerned with the way it's intended, because I don't think it's right. I think they've made some mistakes here that were going to be really hard to back out of. And um, you can't alienate people. You can't cut people off. It's not, uh, not the way to, to get uh, support. What you just heard is the makings of what we think are a major political realignment for both parties. It's happening constantly. The music stops every two years, and we see where we stand. So what does it all mean for the midterms, the next time the music stops, and the battle for power in Congress? Dante Chinney and Amy Walter, join me next. Welcome back. We are looking at seven counties as crucibles for larger political trends to tell us what to expect in the midterms and beyond. So joining me now, NBC News data journalist Dante Chinney. He's the director of the American Communities Project. Please get lost on his website there. It's fantastic. <laughs> and Amy Walter, editor of the Cook Political Report. All right. So our seven counties, guys, yeah. have sliced the electorate essentially this way. we got young and progressive voters in Dane. you got the college-educated Republican business 
business folks in, in Delaware, union people in Pennsylvania, rural minorities in North Carolina, evangelicals in North Georgia, and then sort of new sub suburban voters in, in Washoe, old suburban voters in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. So there's our, our seven slices here. Uh, we've heard a lot from Dante and me. Amy, <laughs> it, you know, not all seven yeah. matter. Like, if there's two, what are, you, what are you gravitating towards and the trend line you're most intrigued about going into 22? Well, I really am intrigued by um, two things that came out of 2021 that turnout went way up in places like Nevada, mm -hmm. and yet, including Latino turnout that surged, AAPI, Asian American uh, turnout surged, and yet the numbers in terms of the, the win for mm -hmm. Joe Biden was almost exactly the same as it was in 2016. Numbers haven't Hillary changed Clinton. that much. The we numbers haven't Washoe changed up. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can put Washoe up. But Washoe is, you know, we, we spend so much time in Clark County. Mm -hmm. We spend so much time in Las Vegas that this is the next new sort of frontier, right? Because it's fast growing. Mm -hmm. This is on the outskirts. This is Reno. But what, a lot of this growth, I think, is going to be determined by another group we're going to spend a lot of time with, which is college-educated yeah. white voters who are moving to parts of the country that... Maybe 10 years ago, they wouldn't have spent as much time thinking about. Mm -hmm. They're affordable. These are more affordable cities, mm -hmm. mid-sized cities, close to recreation. You just Re Re dri Reno. drive over you just to did. Lake Tahoe. Reno has it all, yeah. and it's an affordable place it's to live. It's an affordable place to live, and that's changing then the makeup uh -huh. of the electorate in a state that we think of as being driven, prim and it still is, being yeah. primarily driven just by the kinds of people who work in and around the industry, the service right. industry in, in Clark County. You know, Reno has a feel of, of we were talking to our, our reporter down there, Guad Venegas said, feels like Phoenix 10 years ago. But Denver developed this yes. way too. Exactly. Right? All of the yeah. Western, it's interesting. And exactly. Reno looks a lot different than Las Vegas, and, and we've been shorthanding too often. So I do think we're, we're getting a better we're education there. And, and, about, and you, know. you know, Nevada's one of those states that on yeah. paper, Democrats should be able to hold on to that yeah. in the Senate race. But in a bad year for Democrats, that's a still a very dicey proposition. You love all your counties the same, I know, just I like you love all your children the same. Favorites. You have no, have no favorites. favorites. But what's the, what's, the, what's the data point you're most looking forward to, to seeing what moves? Uh, I, am, I am especially interested in Delaware County because yeah. I've been going there for like five years now. This is Ohio. This yeah, is, yeah, yeah. You, love, just North like Columbus. The, you say the white shoe Republican, right? yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. that means to yeah. some people. We throw yeah. it out there. Golfing Republicans. Yeah. Right. Uh, these are Romney. Repu Romney was their guy. Romney won this county by 23 points. Yeah. Four years later, Donald Trump won it by 17 points. Four years after that, Donald Trump won it by seven points. Uh, wow. This is a place that is, you know, and I do think that like that initial, you know, that 17 point win in 2016 was Republicans in the county saying that like, I'm still a Republican. I'm stick. He's my yeah, man. Right. He's the Republican. I'm a party voter. They're party voters. Right. Yeah. Four years later. Yeah. No. So J.D. Vance and, and Josh Mandel, which whatever one of these guys, they have, they're not Delaware County Republicans, are they? No. They are not. And I'm really curious to see. That's, that's yeah. one of the things I want to go there. I, I want to go because I have talked to people there, spend some time. What do they think about their Senate race? Because the people I've talked to, they're like, we, we really like the moderate candidate who they think is Timken. Right, who's not Jane Timken. A lot. No, right. she is. She is. She, she is the she's one that's the establishment. But they have not, Rob Portman's wife the, held a fundraiser for. Her. She hasn't wink, gotten wink, the, the, right. the hold there yet, and they're a little worried. Look, a midterm election, Amy. The beauty we've got two bookends of counties that really are about. We're trying to figure out: Do they care about the midterms? Right. Right. Chattooga County in Georgia. Do they care if Trump's not on the ballot? What right. happens there? Right. These are evangelicals. This is a great county for Trump. And then Dane County, right, which is the other way. Do we? We we, we heard. Do they care Younger enough about their midterm and, election? That's right. right. Younger voters, et cetera. The one, the one other piece, though, is we know a midterm electorate is usually older, whiter, right? It's less diverse uh, and more highly educated. Yep. Now, in the old days, that would be bad news for Absolutely. Democrats, yeah. right? Because that's not their Two electorate. Two of them are good news for Republicans, but one of yeah. those little descriptors may right. be bad news. White, non white college yes. is, is better. But even a drop-off in not the non-white vote, okay? Mm -hmm. Again, traditionally, this would hurt Democrats. But remember, so much of the gains made by Trump and other Republicans in places like Nevada, in places like Arizona, Texas, Florida, were from less frequent right. voters of color who probably hadn't voted before. They were new voters. Yeah. And are they going to turn out in 2022? How many of the people that showed up in 2020, right. record number of people, where are they going? They're sloshing around in this system, and we don't quite know where they're going to end up 
two years, four years from now? You know, Dante, the one reason we like to do it this way is because there's two powerful forces in American politics right now. Partisanship feels very powerful. Absolutely. We're trying to see, does geography ever trump it? Right. Right. When does it ever trump it? I do think Anson County is our canary in the coal mine here. Right. These are rural African-Americans who truly don't feel like they've been talked to. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's I mean, if you think rural America feels like it's kind of been ignored, particularly the Democratic, Democratic Party, Party, whose coalition right. is mostly urban and suburban. Oh, wait, rural minorities. Well, guess what? South Texas. Right. Uh, southern so, part of North Carolina. Yeah. Right. Rural Latinos, rural it's not it's not they're not showing up it's a very different and again like i do think democratic party is pretty good at talking to urban urban blacks urban hispanics i think they still are pretty good at doing that rural i don't know i was struck by in the piece amy the, the one union guy in, in lucerne pennsylvania he goes you know I, I wear work boots cowboy boots you know i go to a democratic meeting <laughs> no one looks like me right that used to be the standard uniform yeah. in many of these counties. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, many well, of these in, states. Well, in a good union, uh, you know, good, I, but, I covered Dick Gephardt. Right. Dick, I'd, I go to a lot of union rallies when Dick Gephardt was running for president and all this stuff. I, I you know, Except it's now not the, the same. The union, you don't have the shiny jacket. You don't no, see it. No, but yeah. what they do have are the service workers, yeah. right? So whether it's culinary workers in Nevada who are their folks who are working on the strip yeah. or whether you have SEIU and other, they're primarily female. Yeah. They are people of color. The other thing um, about geography that is a really interesting feature is it used to be there was much more regionalism, yep. right? That, that a Detroit suburb is really different from a Texas suburb, which is really different yeah. from a Western suburb. Now you could be from Atlanta yeah. suburbs, yes. Philadelphia suburbs, yeah. and guess what? You have more in common than yeah. the people it's, who are 20 miles the down whole, the street from you. The Whole Foods is about five miles away, exactly. no matter where you live. Exactly. Atlanta is more like Chicago than it is like Southern Georgia. Don't forget that. Yeah. 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 Uh, I could continue to get. This out, would be so fun. I'm going to go ahead and. and Put the stop sign out. All Thank right. you, guys. That's all we have for Meet the Press reports this week. We t just told you all about the voters. Well, next week, we're going to break down the races to watch the candidates. That'll be fun. Join us for a peek at the 2022 midterms. Thanks for being here. I'll see you next week here on Peacock and this Sunday on Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.